Okay, we've considered one of the three perspectives that we're going to look at in ethics, and that is our motive, our heart attitudes. So now we're going to shift gears. Let's consider the goal or the situation, the results of our actions. We have to consider the circumstances of the situation we're in when we make ethical decisions. Now why do we even need to consider our situation or the results of our actions? Isn't right, right, and wrong, wrong? Well, look at it this way. One reason we have to consider our situation is that the circumstances can vary and that can change which portion of God's Word we apply. Okay. Think about this example. Let's say a student is running full speed down the hall, knocking other students over just so he won't be late to class. Well, I'm probably going to write him up with a demerit or something like that. But let's say the student is running full speed down the hall, knocking other students over because his teacher just had a heart attack and the student is running for help and he's doing a good thing. You see, the same actions, different circumstances, a different evaluation of right or wrong just because of different circumstances. Another example of this is in the Bible in Proverbs 26, 4-5. Solomon says there, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Then he says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Okay, see, we've got two contradictory commands here, apparently. One of them says, Don't answer a fool. The next verse is, answer a fool. It's the same words. You can't say, well, different Hebrew words or anything. He's saying, don't do it, and then do it. So, the thing is, we have to consider the results of our actions to decide which one of these we're going to do. If we believe that answering the fool according to his folly, that is, we base our argument on his assumptions, if we believe that that will lead us to seeming just like him, then don't do it. But if answering him according to his folly, that is, basing your argument on his assumptions, if you think that will lead to him realizing his folly, then do it. The results determine what we're going to do. So we have to remember that ultimately God himself is concerned about results. God is working everything out for the goal of summing everything up in Christ. That's his goal. He is bringing his kingdom on earth. You see, God looks at the ends, the goals, the outcomes of his work, and he governs his actions in life to lead to those goals. In our individual lives, God is concerned about the outcomes or the goals. Think about Romans 8.28. God works all things together for good for those who love him. He considers the end and the then he governs the actions towards that end. So, think about this question now. Does the end justify the means? Okay. Think about that. See, God can even use ungodly means to achieve his purposes. The crucifixion is the primary example of this. But that doesn't justify those means. We're told in Matthew 26 and Acts 2 that God condemns the people who crucified Jesus even though the crucifixion was in his plan and brought about the result of our salvation. So we could say that only godly means are justified to achieve his purposes. So the end does not justify any means at all. But in another sense, we could say that the end does justify the means. You see, any action we take that is in the complete sense leading to God's glory is a legitimate action. Anything we do that would bring glory to God would be legitimate. Now you have to think what actually brings glory to God, but if it truly does, then it's a legitimate action. So actually what we need to do is to think the situations we face are so complex that we need to seek to evaluate on the basis of Scripture not only the goals or the results, but also the means for achieving them. 
In practice, we often justify an action because it leads to a good end, and perhaps the means are indifferent. You know, if I'm deciding which route to take home, I have a number of options, and it's not an issue of ethics. I can choose to go one direction or another way, and either way gets me home. But let's say that my wife needs me at home quickly for some reason. Then I should choose the route that gets me home the quickest, and that becomes the right way to go home. Now that's a mundane issue, but even in more important ethical situations there may be various ways to do something. Think about child discipline as an example. The Bible condones corporal punishment. It makes it very plain that spanking children is an appropriate means of disciplining our children. But the Bible doesn't say that corporal punishment is the only way to discipline our children. We don't spank our children for every infraction, big or small, they might commit. You might spank them, but you might also remove privileges. I mean, remember Jesus' parable about the man and the talents. The man who did not invest his talent had it taken from him. So, it might be appropriate to punish our children by removing things from them. Or, we might just reprove our children verbally. Proverbs teaches about the wise man who learns from reproof. Or, you might give your children more work to do as discipline. God punished Adam by making his work difficult and unpleasant. You see, all these are ways we might discipline our children. So how do you know which one to do? Well, you consider the situation. Think about what your child did wrong. What was his attitude when he did wrong? Maybe he willfully rebelled and so he needs to be spanked severely. Or maybe he honestly forgot what to do and so he should be reproved or given additional work. You think about what your child's nature is like. For one child, a verbal reproof might be crushing to him and would bring about change, while another child might not respond to anything except a spanking. Two of our children fell in this category as well. One of them we could just look at seriously and he would change. The other one we had to spank regularly. What you're doing is you're looking at the desired outcome. Your goal for your child is that he becomes more like Jesus, that he repents of his sin, that he lives a life of holiness. And so you think about what actions can I take to bring that result about most effectively. You look at the situation, the desired results, and use that to direct your action. If the right end or goal is achieved, then the means chosen are the right ones. And notice this is not an open-ended warrant for any and all methods of child discipline. I can't take guidance from Jack Bauer on the TV series 24 and shoot my child in the thigh if he disobeys. I also cannot humiliate my child into obeying by belittling him, like calling him stupid or worthless, because scripture tells me I'm not to exasperate my children. So there are some means I may not use, but remember our boundary approach to ethics. As long as I'm inside that playing field, as long as I'm not doing things God has forbidden, then I'm free to choose the means that will best accomplish the desired ends. Now the point is that we have to consider our situation or our environment when we're thinking about what's right and wrong. Go back to the example I've used of a beggar on the street who asked me for money. If I give him money and he just uses it to buy drugs, and especially if I know that's what he's going to do, I've seen him and I know he's just going to spend the money on drugs, I haven't done a good thing if I give him money. But if I give him money and he uses it to buy food for his family, then that is a good action I've done. We have to think about the outcomes of our actions and the situation we're in. But there are three things that keep us from falling into a pure situation ethics, like what we've seen with John Stuart Mill or Joseph Fletcher. People like Mill and Fletcher leave these factors out, but they are important factors or parts of our situation. First, God is governing our situation through his sovereignty. He rules over all things. He is the one who sets up the situations we face. 
1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now we'll come back to this passage later, but for now we can see God governs our situations. And so when we face a particular situation, we have to remember that God is the one who brought it to pass. Second, another important part of our circumstances is the Word of God, the Bible. You see, if I'm thinking about my circumstances or my situation when I decide on an ethical behavior, I have to remember that part of my situation or part of my circumstances is the fact that God has spoken to me in His Word. He has given me His Word, and that needs to govern my decision. If I try to make moral decisions without Scripture, then I really haven't taken into account all of my circumstances. Third, if we're going to consider the results of our actions, we have to consider the final result, the final judgment. See, this is how we deal with so-called victimless crimes, prostitution, drug use. Okay, maybe on earth there's no bad result from these, although you could argue that point anyway. But let's assume that there are no bad results on earth. But there most certainly is a final judgment. And God will judge those who have violated his word. Those who are sexually immoral, including prostitutes, will be cast into the lake of fire, according to Revelation 22.15. Most purely situational ethics, such as that by Joseph Fletcher, ignores this important outcome of our actions. Their focus is just on this world and on immediate results, not on long-term or eternal results. So we have to consider that as a very important outcome. How is this going to stand up in the final judgment? Now in our next video we're going to look particularly at the issue of tragic moral choices and think about how we can consider those things, those situations that we face biblically.